Hello everyone, welcome to our first lecture. So today we're going to be looking at innate immunity. And so just like we started left off last time, as we can see innate immunity is always on. It's non-specific, relatively non-specific though. It's rapid and there's no memory capacity. In comparison, the adaptive immune system is very pathogen specific responses. It must encounter the pathogen and it reacts to only one antigen or even epitope. And it's often characterized into humoral using B cells and cell mediated using T cells. As you can see here, B cells produce antibody and cell mediated T cells produce cytokines to activate and direct other cell types like macrophages and neutrophils and everything else. And some, cyto and some T cells are cytotoxic. This includes cytotoxic T cells, AKA CDL or TC. So this figure we saw last time so innate responses rely on germline encoded receptors of the innate immune system to recognize pathogens, <clears throat> to recognize pathogens and respond quickly, and there's no memory is generated. In the adaptive immune responses, they rely on variable antigen-specific receptors on lymphocytes to recognize pathogens. The response time requires time for the clonal expansion and differentiation, so this is expansion of our B cell pool and our T cells for that specific antigen, so more time is required. We'll get into detail later. But however, the immune memory is created in the adaptive response, allowing a faster secondary response. So as most of you guys know, you catch a cold one time, and the second, the other time you might not even get it. So this is kind of huge in COVID stuff everyone's talking about, about herd immunity. So it's essentially the same principle with the vaccines, which we'll get into later. So the basic mechanism of host defense. So first, we have our anatomic barriers, which include our skin, mucous membranes, and mucus. This is the mucous membranes in our airways, and in our intestines, and in our, uh, yeah, and even our uh, urinary tract, so urethra and ureters and stuff like that. We also have clearance mechanisms, like through phagocytosis, which is cells destroying other stuff. We also have physiological variables, such as pH. So an example that's easy to know is like the really low pH of the stomach, temperatures such as fever, you know, when your body induces a fever, iron binding proteins like lactiferin and transferrin, which can destroy uh, certain bacteria components. We have enzymatic proteins and chemical defenses, including lysozymes, complement proteins, which we will have a whole section dedicated to later. We also have antimicrobial peptides like defensin. So we have natural, there's certain things in our body that will just be antimicrobial. And we also have our normal microbiota or microflora, which can cause microbial antagonism. So another thing we have is a lysozyme. So here we can see two types of bacteria are gram positive and gram negative. So the biggest distinction you can see right away with our gram negative is this lipopolysaturide. So this is something we'll talk about a ton in this course because it's a common bacterial component. It's also used in several studies. But anyways, we can see so peptidoglycan is a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine, or NAG, and N-acetylmuramic acid, and these are cross-linked by peptide bridges. As you can see here, this are peptidoglycan. Um, lysozymes can cleave linkages between NAG and NAM, breaking the cell wall. So here you can see the lysozyme, the little Pac-Man, going in, destroying the wall. This is basically our way to break through the barrier on the bacteria and get to the cell. And then this is where we can do damage. Interestingly, the lysozyme is actually more effective against this gram positive. As you can see, there's a lipopolysaturide, so we need other mechanisms to get through that. So defensin, this is another anti this is another example of an antimicrobial peptide. So we got our human beta-1 defensin there in the electron micrograph. With the also, you know, you can see the proteins are labeled. So defensins. So defensins are short cationic peptides that are able to disrupt cell membranes of microbes. So the hydrophobic region of a defensin inserts into the membrane layer of the cell, into the membrane bilayer, and it forms a pore. This causes le a leaky membrane, and this targets bacteria, fungi, and enveloped viruses. So once that membrane is exposed, things that aren't supposed to go in the cell go in, and things that shouldn't go out go out. So antimicrobial peptides include defensins, calcithinins, and histidins. These are released by proteolysis from inactive propeptide forms. Defensins have three disulfide bonds stabilizing a confident amphiphatic region. 
allowing interaction with and insertion to the cell membrane. This causes poor formation and causes the loss of membrane integrity. Just as you see in the figure, C-type antimicrobial lectins, such as Reg3, have a similar mode of action but require calcium for their binding activity. So here we can just see there are many innate defenses located at epithelial surfaces. So this epithelial surfaces are, I guess, the high contact zones for pathogens. This is where most, if not most, um, if not all, you know, infections occur. So SARS again comes through the respiratory tract, just as an easy example, or something we eat enters our gut, rotten, bad food, etc. So we can see our mechanical. So basically this breaks it down into our defenses at each level, mechanical, chemical, and microbiological. So mechanical includes epithelial cells joined by tight junctions, making bacteria hard to get through. We also got airflow and fluid in all these, in both the skin and gut. In the lungs, we have movement of cilia. We have the ciliary escalator. And in the eyes and oral, nose and ear cavity, we have our tears and our nasal cilia. So chemical, we have our we have fatty acids on our skin and beta defensins, laminar bollies, and calcidin. These can directly inhibit pathogens. In their gut, we got our low pH in the stomach, which kills many bacteria. We have our enzymes, which can break down, like pepsin, which can break down certain proteins on bacteria and or whatever viruses. We also got our alpha defensins, cryptidins, reg3, and calcitonin. In the lungs, we have our pulmonary surfactant, which has many important purposes but also plays a role in immunity and we have our alpha defensins and in the eyes we've got enzymes and tears and saliva like lysozyme and these can actually break down bacteria other than, and get rid of them through motion we also got our histidines and beta defensins so again this is not overly important but just to keep in mind so the skin so here we got our skin layers here we can just see the anatomy analogy that i like to use is Come, let's get sunburn. And that's just a more of an, an anatomical thing, but you don't, you can just see here in the granulosum, we can see the zoom in of the, we have a water type lipid bilayer, so it makes it, first of all, it's difficult for things to get through, but you know, if we operate our skin, that's why, you know, cut our skin and stuff's easier to get in. But we also have laminar bodies and other cells built into the skin. So here we can see multiple layers of keratinocytes at different stages of differentiation provide a barrier. Some produce antimicrobial peptides, as we discussed in the last slide, and they are secreted into a water-resistant lipid layer, the stratum, stratum corneum, and fatty acids on the skin can also have antimicrobial activity. So now looking at the lungs. So as we discussed, we got our mucus, our cilia, Sorry. We got our mucus or cilia here. Got goblet cells which produce the mucus. Whereas we're constantly producing mucus. We also have our mucus glands, so that's constantly working. So the airway is all aligned by cilia. This causes the movement of mucus, which is secreted by the goblet cells outward. These help with trapping and expulsion of microbes. We also have type 2 pneumocytes, which secrete antimicrobial peptides, including defensins. So in the gastrointestinal tract, which is a huge center for immunological activity, and there's basically a whole fields dedicated to mucus-associated lymphoid tissue, which is a or malt, which is another way we call this area. So we have pannus cells, which are specialized epithelial cells, and the cribs, which produce antimicrobial peptides. This includes alpha defensins and antimicrobial lectins, including Reg3. The low pH of the gut in the presence of the normal gut microbiota further contribute to defense against pathogens. So I guess there's kind of an error here with the slide, but this is just a break. This is just going into the next part of our innate immunity, the cell types. There you go. So key organs and tissues. So key, we'll just go through this quickly. So primary lymphoid organs include the bone marrow where B cells develop. And then we have our thymus, which is T-cell maturation, which is kind of easy to remember because T to T, B to B, although B-cell was named after, it was found in chickens and it's like the bursa, for, it was found in bursa, but anyways, it's easy to remember. So our secondary lymphoid organs include the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the mucus-associated lymphoid tissue or malt. And we also have the galt, which is the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which are mainly look at the pyrus patches, which we'll talk about later. 
Um, so cells and antibodies circulate via the blood and lymph. So the lymphatics, as you can see in this figure, the little green nodge, nodes, many have heard of probably lymph nodes, you can see here, we got the lymph nodes. They drain tissues carrying antigens and cells to lymph nodes and recirculating cells from the nodes back into the blood. So it kind of functions in the way in the, circ in the circulatory system. So, lymph so lymphocytes arise from stem cells and differentiate in primary, which are the central, and lymphoid organs, and then migrate into the secondary peripheral lymphoid organs where they are activated. So here's kind of basically the development and the lineage. So then we have a myeloid lineage, which includes monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, and the granulocytes, which include basophils, mast cells, mast cells, eosinophils, and neutrophils. And we also have the lymphoid lineage, which includes T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. So, <clears throat> sorry. So there are also non-cellular host defense components in the blood. So these include clotting, clotting factors, which help wall off infected areas. During an infection, they can actually essentially contain the area. And these are super important. And we need these, of course. And we also have complement, which is a very complex system <laughs> that we'll get to later. It'll be a nice, interesting lecture. But it's a family of protein, over 30 proteins produced in the liver. Complement has several actions in host defense, including cell lysis, forming here you can see oops, the membrane attack complex that's right there um, and it also functions opsonization and chemotractivity so it basically works with oh, antibodies and uh, tagging uh, different uh, cells for attack um, then we also have immunoglobulins or more commonly known as the antibody which are important in a specific or adaptive immunity So here we go, this is just a brief detail. So the macrophage is involved in phagocytosis and activation of bacterial mechanisms and is involved in its presentation. That's a key uh, piece of information. Focus on what cells are actually presenting antigen because these will definitely be involved in the transition between innate and adaptive compared to some other cells. So we have eosinophils, which are involved in killing of coated antibody-coated parasites. Basophils, which are involved in the promotion of allergic responses and augmentation of antiparasitic immunity. The dendritic cell, which is the most important antigen presenting cell, is involved in antigen uptake in peripheral sites. And we have neutrophils, which are our most abundant white blood cell, which are involved in phagocytosis and activation of bacterial, bactericidal mechanisms. And then our mast cells, which release granules containing histamine and active agents. So here's just a little bit of more information. So as I said, neutrophils are the most numerous, as you can see, a lot bigger than eosinophils and basophils. Again, they're involved in phagocytosis and inflammation. These are a key uh, molecule in just our inflammatory response. Pretty much any response we have, we'll have neutrophils first at the scene to help fight the pathogen. Eosinophils are involved in ADCC, which we'll come to later, but it's antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity against parasites, and also is involved in asthma, which is a key. This, eosinophils are highly researched in asthma studies, and it's sometimes shown in a bad light, but it is important for um, parasites. And then basophils, same thing. They're involved in allergic reactions. Just clear that. So the characteristics of the three granulocytes is that yeah, we can just see here, is that they all contain granules. So that's kind of where they get their name. That's basically what they look under the microscope, but these are the things they release once they attack. So we'll look at more specific, we'll look at these in more detail. So the granulocytes include neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, as we said. So these make up 60 to 7% of our circulating white blood cells. They're multi-lobuled or multi-lobed. They have a multi-lobe nucleus and a unique feature. And this is a unique feature, and this is why they get their name, or the neutrophil, sorry, gets its name as polymorphic nuclear leukocytes. You'll see neutrophils and PMNs refer to each other quite a bit. Uh, these contain granules with different enzymes depending on subtype, like the basophil or neutrophil. So 
one, like the bisphenol can release histamine and neutrophils release a lot of granzymes and stuff to kill the cells. So these granulocytes have a short lifespan, only an hour to days, and their production is increased during infection and they rapidly travel to sites of inflammation. They are the first responders and the neutrophils are the major subclass of granulocytes. They're the most important phagocytic cells. So eosinophils, they play a key role in inflammation in the late phase hypersensitive, reaction, hypersensitivity reactions and in immunity into parasites. So they're basically involved in killing of antibody-coated parasites, which is a key function. And without them, we can have a lot of issues. So now we're gonna look at the basophil and mast cells, which are quite similar, but slightly different roles. So these both have FC receptors for IgE, which is a type of antibody. So these will respond to antibody responses that are involved in releasing IgE. And this tends to be common in re allergic reactions, but we'll get to that in another lecture. These granules contain meteors involved in type one hypersensitive, hypersensitive reactions or allergies such as histamine. This is one of their key, uh, key molecules in their granules. The difference between these is that mass basophils are basically bloodborne or they basically stay in the blood where mast cells will migrate into the tissues and become macrophages. So this is a little more detailed, but it's good to keep in mind. You can see the big difference with neutrophils is the synthesization of oxidative products. So these are highly effective in killing cells. And you guys may have heard of reactive oxygen species and different types. So we've got like hydrogen peroxide, nitric oxide, superoxide, etc. But yeah, there's, and then you can see all the contents, the granule contents. Neutrophils mainly focus on killing. Eosinophils are focused on uh, parasites. Basophils contain histamine. And you can also see leukotriene and prostaglandin. These are also involved in some uh, allergic reactions. Another key thing to look at is the cytokines as we'll expand more on these. It becomes quite, becomes quite relevant to know which cytokines are basically associated with each molecule. And there's certain key ones that can distinguish them from each, from each other. Just keep that in mind. So now we've got the macrophagy. So monocytes migrate into tissues and different into macrophages. So macrophages are long-lived. They can live in several months in the tissue once they migrate. And they differentiate depending on the tissue they're in. So if they move to the lung, they become alveolar macrophages. The liver, they become Kupffer cells. The brain, microglia. And the kidney, mesangial cells. And they're mainly involved in the phagocytosis and activation of bacterial cytal mechanisms and antigen presentation, which is very important. So the monocytes and macrophages are key phagocytic cells. And they respond to microbes using pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs, which are super, well, basically I've dedicated lectures to the PRRs later, but yeah, keep that in mind, PRRs. And an example would that be CD14, which is a receptor for LPS, as we saw earlier in the gram-negative bacteria. It also, an example, includes mannose receptors, and we'll see those later as well. Certain cell surface receptors allow for opsonization, so they can also opsonize cells. So they have complement receptor 3, or CR3, or CD11B, and FC receptors. So these are important antigen presentation cells, so they can activate T helper cells by presenting antigen in complex with class 2 MHC. And they also help regulate immune, the immune response, whoops, immune response by producing numerous cytokines with different effects. So the macrophage. So we can see here the macrophage expresses receptors from many microbial constituents. So mannose receptor, LPS, TLR4, TLR2, glucan, and scavenge receptors. These will be detailed later, but... So the pattern recognition receptors, we can see receptors for LPS, which includes CD14 and TLR2 and mannose and TLR receptors. We have receptors that enhance phagocytosis, which include the FC receptors for the different subclasses of immunoglobulin G. We also have FC gamma receptor 1, 2, and 3, which are involved in opsonization. We also have the complement receptors, including CR3, which is used for opsonization through complement. We also have receptors used for cell-to-cell -cell interactions and antigen presentation. These are HLA-DR, which is kind of, basically it's class 2 MHC, but that's the human designation. It's the more specific 
terminology. And we also have LFA1, which is an adhesion molecule. These are all important in cell communication, contact, and presentation to the adaptive immune system. So phagocytosis is an important host defense mechanism. It is the clearance of mechanism that removes and kills microbial pathogens. So here are some just questions to keep in mind. So again, the key types we can discuss, there was macrophages, neutrophils, but essentially neutrophils are probably the highest, the most important in at least our acute response. So how do we find pathogens? So chemotaxis. Basically, we use chemotaxis, which allows us to detect and migrate towards certain bacteria and host products. So we have an infection in our skin. Chemotactic factors will essentially tr attract cells to that area. We can detect bacterial products and migrate toward them, including n formomethanyl peptides, and our host products can attract phagocytes. So certain cytokines, which are called chemokines, which are also basically just chemoattractant cytokines. And we also have chemoattractant properties in certain other, other proteins, including complement protein, C5A. So neutrophil receptors, neutroph neutrophils have receptors for antibodies, or the FC receptor, and complement, or the complement receptor. Antibodies and complement attached to pathogens act as tags to allow recognition of pathogens and to speed up phagocytosis through opsonization. So essentially, m microbes will get tagged with these F2 receptors through antibodies and complement, and it basically allows these innate cells to see it and easily bind. So, and steps in phagocytosis. So first, we have attachment. So target bacteria meets the macrophagy. So the phagocytes adhere to the microbes and ingest them. Then we have the ingestion where the microbe becomes, is inside the phagosome. As you can see in the figure. So here we have the phagosome. Then we'll have fusion, where the phagosome fuses with the lysosome, which contains the destructive enzymes. Then we have the creation of the phagolysosome. Then next we have digestion, where the microbe in the phagolysosome is destroyed by enzymes, include proteases and lipases and antimicrobial peptides like defensins. We also have the oxidative burst, which plays a role in killing pathogens. So this is talked about nitrogen oxide, reactive oxygen species like and hydrogen peroxide. So these things are very effective. Also known as the respiratory burst. But we'll come to that later in more detail later. And then the final phase is release, where the debris from digested microbe is, whoops, is released from the phagocyte and the phagosome fuses to the cell membrane and its digested material is released from the phagocyte. And those are cleared by other cells. So here, I tried to put this in, but it did not work. But there's two animated videos here that can just go through the process. But here, it's just a quick figure. We go from the bacterium, oops, bacteria, the phagosome, then we have the phagolysosome, degraded and the contents are released. That's a quick way to sum it up. So next we'll talk about opsonization. So opsonization. Opsonization is a process where a particle like a virus or bacteria or another antigen is coated with an antibody and or a complement protein which enhances phagocytosis. So here we got our FC receptor and our complement receptor. Antibodies and complement proteins are involved in this process and are referred to as opsonins. So antibodies attached to a pathogen can also attach to the F receptors on the surface of phagocytes and certain complement proteins attached to pathogens and to complement receptors on the surface of phagocytes. So complement can still directly attach to a phagocyte, but we also have these receptors just in case. Attachment of the phagocyte to the pathogen is improved and this greatly speeds up the rate of phagocytosis. So when a phagocytic cell comes to attack the cell, it makes it, so, it, makes it easier to attach to, not just an easier target to see. So here's just an example. See here's the FC receptors for antibodies. Our microbe is coated with antibody. They bind to the FC receptor, causes a strong binding, and now the cell can go in and engulf the cell. So this process of improving phagocytosis by helping attachment of the phagocyte to the pathogen, an antibody attached to the pathogen and the phagocytic cell. So here we can just do this little process. The phagocyte attaches to the antibody and it uses its FC receptors to bind to the FC region of the antibody. Then this results in a much faster ingestion because it can grip better and it's easier to target. 
So again, the video didn't work, but just to summarize, macrophage and neutrophils are important in phagocytic cells. And here's again the pathway. So as mentioned earlier, we have the respiratory boost, boot, burst. Sorry. So this is when our cells release a bunch of different reactive oxygen species that are highly involved in killing the cell. So here's just a simple pathway. Not simple, but we have our oxygen and our NADB, NADPH complex, or enzyme. We get our superoxide, nitric oxide, hydrogen peroxide. Either way, we, it's just, this is kind of the, as you can see, the reactive oxygen products generated in respiratory bursts can kill microbes. So these are just the key ones to keep in mind that will come up a lot in literature. So anyways, activated phagocytes are more effective at killing pathogens. Due to the respiratory burst, which is a process where activated macrophages and neutrophils produce reactive oxygen products, we have hydrogen peroxide, which you can see here, hydroxyl radicals, superoxide anion, and nitric oxide. These products damage and kill microbes. Phagocytes can be activated by contact with bacterial products such as LPS on gram negatives and activated complex components in certain cell kinds, like interferon gamma, also seen as this very often. So again, here's just a nice pathway. I'll just get the text to come in. Go back one, there you go. So here's the pathway. We have a bacteria merged with a phagocyte. We can see our lysosomes in the cell. So we go through our sta uh, standard process. We go form the phagosome. Then we got the fusion of the phagosome and lysosome where we form our phagolysosome. And this is where we have the release of all our granu granule products including our lysozyme, proteases, defensins, but also our reactive oxygen species, including superoxide, hydrochloric acid, nitric oxide, etc. And then the cells degrade it and release. We also have our other mediators like lactiferin and defensins. Yeah. So here's just a good summary, another great figure from the textbook of just a summary of the mechanisms used by phagocytes. So they have acidification, you know, low pH, toxic oxygen-derived products, as we discussed in the last slide with the respiratory burst. We have our nitric, nitric oxide. We have our antimicrobial peptides, as we discussed earlier. We have enzymes, several, you know, enzymes for proteins, fats, lipases, like glycosome. And we also have competitors. These can compete with pathogens. And you can see lactiferin, which sequesters iron. And we have vitamin B12 binding protein as well. So next part, we're going to look at innate, going from the innate system to the adaptive system. So just to recap, we can see our cells again. We don't have to go through them again, but the reason we're looking at this is the antigen. This is the most important antigen printing cell, and we'll get into detail. So genetic cells are very, dendritic cells are very efficient professional antigen presenting cells. So we need APCs because ATPs present antigen to T cells, so T cells can see antigen and respond to it. Professional APCs express class 2 MHC, so keep that in mind, for antigen presentation, which means they interact with the T, T helper cells. They also express certain co-stimulatory molecules, including CD80, also known as B7, and CD86, B72. So these are co-stimulatory molecules that are needed for interaction. So you can't have just the interaction with the class 2 MHC, you need both. And as you can see here, co-stimulator molecules help activate T cells. So dendritic cells can take up particles through phagocytosis or micropinocytosis in order to present antigen to T cells. However, they do not play a key role in phagocytosis as phagocytic cells. So they're kind of more of, like I said, specialized antigen presenting cells. The more the phagocytosis through macrophages and neutrophils. So as you can see here, we kind of have like the division of innate and adaptive. But here, dendritic cells are essentially the key bridge between the two systems. So mature dendritic cells activate T cells by displaying antigen and providing additional signals. They're specialized in initiating adaptive immunity. Dendritic cells also act in, as immunoregulatory cells, producing cytokines that activate and regulate inflammatory responses and control helper T cell differentiation into different subclasses. So that's a really important topic but we'll get to that later it's a we'll save that for more detailed lectures so another type of a uh, so let me just 
just get this slip up. Yeah, so another type of innate cell that is quite new in the research, actually. It's one of those cells that we actually missed for a while in research, including that happened with dendritic cells as well, but it's called the innate lymphoid cells. So the ILCs share many features of lymphocytes, but ILCs do not have highly specific antigen receptors that characterize TB lymphocytes. So they're still classified as innate. We have natural killer cells, which are an important type of ILC active in innate host defense against viruses. You've probably heard of NK cells before, but they're now classified as a type of ILC. Lymphoid cells acting in the adaptive response include are the lymphocytes, the T and B cells. So just again, the lymphoid NK cells come from the lymphoid lineage, but also so ILCs. So yeah, NK cells are a type of innate lymphoid cell and belong to the group one ILCs. There are three groups, one, two, and three, and we'll get to those later. So NK cells. NK cells are key players in innate immunity, especially against viruses. They're closely related to T cells. NK cells are characterized as a type of innate lymphoid cell, or ILC, and belong to the group one. They have a key role in cytotoxic, cytotoxic activity, but NK cells are not specific like CD, CDLs. Regarding target recognition, they are part of the innate immune system. So they basically function similar to cytotoxic T lymphocytes, but they're not specific. NK, NK cells targets are virus-infected cells some, and some tumor cells. So there's a lot of studies that look at these involved in tumor regulation. NK cells have various strategies for recognizing and attaching to target cells, but we'll get to this in more detail later. So there are two types of lymphoids, lymphocytes involved in adaptive immunity. The T lymphocytes, aka T cells, are thymus-derived, and B lymphocytes, or B cells. Each has unique surface markers and roles, which we'll discuss in detail. So B cells. B cells differentiate and produce antibodies and can also act as professional APCs, which is an important key aspect. So they interact with T cells all the time. T cells include the CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells, also known as T helper and cytotoxic T lymphocytes. T helper cells control the immune system. They're basically the regulators and they kind of guide the immune system into what response is needed. So we have Th1 and Th2 cells. Also, talk about later, Th17 and T8, T follicular helper cells. But they all play different roles in immune regulation and cause different pathways and different cascades. And we also have some T helper cells which become regulatory T cells or T regs. Interactions between T helper cells and B cells and T cells, macrophage and junior cells are essential for the control of the immune response. So essentially, T helper cells interact with innate cells, macrophage DCs, basically to guide them what to do and how, basically they're the plan, the generals, they're telling us what to do. So here we can see our B cell and T cell. We won't go into too much detail now, but distinguish difference here, T cell receptor and B cell receptor. Um, that's the basic difference now, but we'll get to each of these different molecules after, and a lot of these interact with each other anyways. So we have cell surface markers such as CD4, CD8, and CD3, which are often identified using antibodies for specific, specific for these markers. So this is kind of how we study cells. So we'll send in an antibody that will attach to CD4 only, and we'll count it and see. So then we can count how many cells are of that specific cell that has that specific marker. So then these are often, this process will be explored further in the later in the course. And when we look at monoclonal antibodies and hybridomas, so this is a type of immuno lab technique as I said, where we tag certain cells and essentially count them. So how are cells identified? We have numerous cell surface markers are now cataloged. There's over 220. These are referred to as CD or also known as cluster differentiation. Example would be CD3, which is present on all T cells. So again, we can use that to count T cells. CD4, which is present on T helper, and CD8 on CDL. So some CD molecules are differentiation markers expressed at a certain stage of differentiation. Some CD molecules are activation markers expressed only when a cell is activated. Example, a CD25, which is part of the high affinity IL-2 receptor only expressed on activated T cells. So again, this is important when we do studies because, okay, we're going to look for CD25. This will only bind to activated T cells. So you're not going to, when you're testing an immune response, you don't want to know the T cells that aren't doing anything. You want the activated ones. It's just a way to understand that these markers allow us to be specific with our 
understanding and allow us to identify many cells in the system. And here you can just get an example, activation, 38, 25, differentiation, 1, 38, 3, it's 19. This can get very complex, but we'll talk about it later. So our T and B, B cells. So T cells express T cell receptor, as we said earlier. So here we go, T cell receptor, which is either CD4 or CD8, which makes it either T helper or CDL. And they all have CD3. So we have key subtypes, which are T helper cells, which is CD4, which produce cytokines, which are basically communication molecules. And we have cytotoxic T cells, which are involved in killing specific target cells. Our, our B cells express membrane immunoglobulin, aka the B cell receptor, as we see here, but it has very associated molecules. And associated receptor IgB, Ig alpha beta, that will always be attached with the immunoglobulin. And activated B cells produce antibody, specific or pathogens that they recognize. So there's different types. There's IgM, IgG, IgA, IgE, and IgD, which is not here. But yeah, basically the molecule on the membrane is the same that is released. It's just they're different molecules. And we have our antigen presenting cells, which are also essential, which include dendritic cells, macrophages, and even some B cells. So just some key points here. Cells acting in innate immunity respond rapidly, but not specifically. Phagocytosis is a key activity, and the key phagocytes include our neutrophils, our PMNs, and our macrophages. Macrophage. In adaptive immunity, we have our lymphocytes, our T and B cells, which respond to specific antigens, but require time to respond. T cells must interact with APCs in order to respond to antigen. And just to recall, the three types of cells that are APCs are the dendritic cells, macrophage, and one that people tend to forget is the B cell. So the response to infection is a continuum between innate and immunity. So not to belabor this, but we can just see, this is just the process of infection. So here we can see our microbes, breach in the skin, local infection penetration, then it breaches into the tissues, so here we have our normal defense of the skin, chemical barriers. We have our wound healing is induced. We have our microbial, antimicrobial proteins complement. Here is where we have our system work, our innate system go to go to work. We have our complements, cytokines, chemokines, NK cells, etc. Eventually, the cells communicate with adaptive immune system. Then our B and T cells come back. Here you can see the antibodies. The infection is cleared by our specific antibodies and T cell dependent macrophages. So here's just a final summary slide. Key properties of adaptive, aka acquired immunity, is the discrimination between self and non-self antigens. So due to the elimination of T and B cells that react to self antigens during maturation, and ability of T cells to recognize antigen only in combination with self MHC class 1 and 2. So we'll get to this positive and negative selection later. Adaptive immunity also has memory, it is specific, and this is due to the receptor specificity of T and B cells, and the several mechanisms of uh, recognition and the adaptive is slower than the innate response but provides more effective protection with subsequent exposure so again thank you guys so i'll see you in the next lecture